All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Toby. If you're in this room, you're probably here to uh, see a talk called The Cathedral in the Bazaar, or Dual Booting for Fun and Profit, uh, using Linux to enhance Temple OS. I'm not really sure if you want to be in this room, but if you are in this room, this is what's going to happen. Uh, really quick, um, if you want to make any changes or try anything or experiment, do make backups. Uh, and verify that your backups work. That is very, very important. You can break stuff very easily with Temple OS, with any OS, really. So, you know, take caution and think about what you do before you do it. Um, if you aren't particularly technical, this is a great talk then, um, we're going to be mastering uh, boot records. And that's more or less it. We're not going to go into deep, deep, deep level stuff in the kernel. I'll be mentioning some stuff. But you don't have to be a programmer. You don't have to be a whiz. This is really entry-level stuff. Um, I would really appreciate it if after this talk you, you take a look at Temple OS, learn some things about it, learn some things about yourself in the process. Um, in terms of difficulty level, I'm giving this four out of five boots. Because uh, this talk was made for bootin' and by gum, that is just what we are going to do. So, start at the beginning. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth Stop me if you've heard this one <laughs> The earth was without form and void And darkness was over the face of the deep And it probably looked a little something like this <laughs> Quick show of hands, if anyone here remembers when this was what home computing looked like. A lot of hands. I see a lot of hands out there, a lot more than I was expecting. The rest of you just don't understand that when you set up the home computer for the very first time and you powered it on and it beeped a couple of times, this is what you saw. And this is all that you saw. Or maybe some of you remember this. That blinking cursor that's like, what do you do next? I didn't have a Commodore 64 growing up. I had this. I didn't know what to do with this. I had to figure something out. I wasn't the only one. Other people have come along and said, we've got to figure out a way to make this kind of more user friendly. We have to be able to adapt something from the void, we need to give this like a hint of color and functionality and skeuomorphism. Um, does anyone recognize Deskmate? Deskmate was a Tandy-based uh, window manager, basically. This ran on top of DOS. This was basically a, a, a cheaper version of like Windows 1.0 or Windows 2.0. Not an operating in and of itself, but it was a user interface. And it was incredibly useful. It made the machine more functional for someone who wasn't very technically minded. There's a text editor in here. There is a spreadsheet application. There's a calendar. You can see it's, it still runs in 2024. It doesn't loop after the year 2000. Um, and it has games, right? Hangman is a program that came with Deskmate. And it's functional, right? It, you can recognize that this is a game of Hangman. There's a little guy up on a gallows, and there's a jail and a saloon and a hotel with really crude graphics that are built inside of it, but you can guess that this is Hangman and you can interact with it by typing things. Does anybody know what the word is? Cloisters. Give that man 64 silver dollars. The word is cloisters. I just randomly came across that and I'm like, I'm putting that in the talk. <laughs> when you have old machines like this, what you would typically end up doing before UEFI existed, you would use the, the DOS-style MBR file format in order for your machine to be able to start and run DOS or Windows 95 or something like that. And the general idea is, imagine that your hard disk is just a big old string of zeros that go from zero to however big the drive is. The first 512 of those bytes are really, really important. It's called the master boot record. We'll get into that in a second. Then you always leave a little bit of a gap, sometimes a little gap, sometimes a really big gap. And then at some point, you, you configure a partition table and you say, this is where 
I'm going to actually start storing the data that I want my machine to run. Now the master boot record needs to know where that is so that it can go and actually start your operating system. Uh, you were always allowed to have about four primary partitions and then you would have additional partitions if you configured them to be extended, but nobody ever really did that. And every single one of these partitions is basically a different volume in DOS or in Windows. So you would start with your C drive, then you would have maybe a second partition, uh, you call that your D drive and you would store you know, files and games and things on D. If something bad happened to C, all the stuff on D was probably still going to be, uh, to, to be okay. Uh, you could also use this uh, to put a second operating system on your old machine. So you could run, for example, DOS or Windows in one partition and Linux in another. Uh, you make two partitions, you boot, uh, you boot your, your Windows or your DOS installer, you install DOS, then you go in and you say, hey Linux, there's already something here, don't overwrite the entire drive, just go to this one second partition, install yourself there, and then I'm going to put a bootloader in, into that master boot record, that knows that it can find DOS over here and Linux over there. Now, the first 512 bytes of your disk are super important. That is where the partition table gets stored. There's other stuff in there as well that basically tell your machine when it starts up, it doesn't know what to do. It checks the MBR. The MBR will say, ah, you need to look over here to find your next set of instructions. And that's how you're going to load whatever the user wants you to run. The partition table is in there as well because it needs to be able to tell your machine where to look, partition one or partition two. It's in there. It's also why you don't ever actually run dd if dev zero over slash dev slash sda. That will wipe out your, your MBR pretty quickly. And don't do that unless that is really what you want to have happen. So just because you can put the bootloader in your MBR does not mean that every bootloader has to be only 512 bytes. There's lots of different kinds of bootloaders that are out there. You're probably more familiar with Grub and Lilo. Lilo's not nearly as, as prevalent anymore as it used to be. Um, and then on Windows, there's NT Loader, and there's also EasyBCD, which I think is proprietary, but it can boot Windows and Linux pretty well. It, it depends on what the maker of your operating system wants to be able to use. It can be an OS agnostic uh, bootloader like Grub, or it can be something very, very OS, um, very OS specific. Do, 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 whenever you're ready for the next slide. Mm, 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 Sorry mm, about mm, that. Mm, 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 mm. Thanks for the tune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all the bootloader does is it finds and loads the kernel wherever it is told to go and look. So uh, by now you should be pretty comfortable understanding that just bootloaders exist and they let you pick different, uh, different OSs. So let's pick a different OS other than, than DOS or other than Windows. Let's get something that's fast. Let's get something that's free. Let's get something that's 64-bit, that's you know, which would be great to run against DOS, right? <laughs> Uh, I want something that's going to be developer friendly so that I can write some software for it. I want some, some, some coding tools. It should be non-proprietary. It should be licensed unencumbered. I want to be able to modify it, customize it. And it's an operating system, so you want the creator of that OS to have a reputation for being really nasty and yelling at people a lot. <laughs> so you know what we're going to pick, right? L l l actually, this set of requirements does not actually narrow it down all that much. I can think of at least three different <laughs> OSs that fit all of these pretty well. But there is only one that I'm really going to be talking about right now, which is why you're all here and I don't understand. It's Temple OS. Raise your hand if you have heard of Temple OS before. My people. All right. Temple OS is free. It is license unencumbered. It is a public domain operating system. That's better than GPL, right? It's 64-bit native. It won't run in 32-bit emulation mode. It's got a custom kernel that is built with its own custom compiler. Both of those are written in a custom language, which is C-ish. It's C-like. It's called Holy C. <laughs> this, this operating system has stuff that just boggles my mind. Transparent file compression. 
It has its own custom file system, its own custom date time library, which is amazing. It's got its own custom documentation format called DollDoc for dollar documentation system or dollar, dollar document system. Custom 2D graphics and 3D graphics libraries that exist inside the documents. And it is absolutely bulletproof when it comes to network security because it doesn't have a network stack. <laughs> Transparent file comp compression. You want to turn that on, all you do is you rename the file to end in dot capital Z. Uncompressing the file is renaming it so that it doesn't end in dot Z. That's it. The Red Sea file system. I don't quite understand that this particular comment that I, that I took from the documentation. It's a simple 64-bit file system, which is similar to FAT32, but it doesn't use a file allocation table. Well, then it's not like system, it's not like FAT32. It's its own different thing. It is, it, you can see that there is a FAT32-like design, but it doesn't allocate clusters for storage. If you want a one megabyte file, you get one megabyte of, of data and you write your data there. If you open that file and you add more data to it, you get a different set of data, which is larger than one megabyte, and your new file gets written there and the old one gets dereferenced. Um, it says files are stored in contiguous blocks and cannot grow in size. So technically, that makes Red C a next-gen copy on write file system, guys. <laughs> It's up, there, it's up there with ZFS or ZFS. It's up there with ButterFS. Eat your heart out, ButterFS. This one's actually functional. <laughs> now, Red C is not compatible with FAT32. You can't convert FAT32 to Red C or vice versa, but Temple OS supports both. And we'll get to that in a second. POSIX time is what attracted me originally to Temple OS. Uh, Linux and Unix in general have a timing problem. Uh, they count the number of seconds since the 1st of January, 1970. And every day, that timer goes up by 86,400 seconds because that's the number of seconds that are in a day. But that means that in 68 years from 1970, uh, that 32-bit timer that they use, it's assigned 32-bit integer, is going to roll over back to zero. Uh, and that's called the Y2038 problem. It's a really serious issue that's, that's being worked on now. You know, no, we shouldn't panic, but we should know it was probably a poor design decision back in 1970. They had no idea when they were designing Unix that they were, it was still going to be in use now and we were all going to be in this room talking about it. <laughs> uh, Unix was originally designed by basically two or three people because one of them wanted to play his Kerbal Space Program precursor on a new set of hardware. It was an amazing story about how Unix came to be. But the, the Unix timer is a signed 32-bit integer and that's a real problem for Unix and Linux. Temple OS doesn't have that problem. And there's a little block of code up there, uh, which is written in Holy C. I don't know if any of you have seen Holy C before, but you should probably be able to figure out what this does just from looking at it. It says I64, sounds like it's a 64-bit integer. It's a, a class called CDate, and it contains two different variables in it. One is an unsigned 32 something, U32, called time, and one called I32, you can guess that that's an assigned 32-bit integer called date. Temple OS measures time in a 64-bit format, but not 64 bits of counting seconds. It measures moments of time in one given day, and then it counts calendar days since it's epic, you know, it's, it's day zero, it's day one, which was the 2nd of January in 0 AD. <laughs> um, point of contention, there was no year zero at all. So the Temple OS epoch does not, or epoch, does not exist. It's, it's this fictional point in time. I'm sure you could pick up a, a point and say somewhere around BCE is probably what he meant there, but there was no year zero. Suffice to say, if you're only counting calendar days instead of seconds since a certain point of time, you get a lot more space to be able to count. So most timekeeping that we use in the Western Hemisphere is based on the Gregorian calendar. Uh, the Gregorian calendar dates back to 1582. It was ratified by Pope Gregory the 13th, not Pope Gregory the first. That's an important distinction. Um, Pope Gregory then died like a couple of years uh, after 
he ratified the new calendar. It would be weird if he died before he ratified it. <laughs> Prior to that, everyone used the Julian calendar, and most, uh, most nations in the world used the Gregorian calendar. They moved over from the Julian calendar eventually. There were a couple centuries of contention there where some folks were on one calendar, other folks uh, were on the other. But the important thing to take away here is that zero is a smaller number than 1582. Yeah, someone was shocked by that. Um, that means that the entirety of the Gregorian calendar system fits quite comfortably into a Temple OS timestamp. Uh, that's not 68 years, that's about 2,000 years, and there's room for millions of years more beyond that. Temple OS does not have a Y2000 or a Y2038 problem. It probably has like a Y4 million you know, AD problem, but hopefully we will have patched that by then. <laughs> I've explained a lot of the, the what's in Temple OS, but I haven't actually said anything about why it exists. Uh, it started in 2003. Uh, written by a guy pretty much single-handedly. His name was Terry Davis. Uh, it began life as the J operating system. It went through some name changes. Um, he got popular online and kind of memed while he was promoting Luzthos. Uh, my personal favorite, Sparrow OS, and then eventually he called it Temple OS. Um, it, there's a quote here. I think it's from Know Your Meme. Uh, that says, Davis claims much of the operating system's development was dictated by God and even claiming that the OS was meant to be God's third temple. So this is not just an operating system, it's kind of a religious experience. Uh, there's a really good article uh, that Vice wrote called God's Lowly Programmer uh, that I recommend you check out if uh, you want to know more about Terry Davis. Yes. And this is what it looks like. Wow. Okay, there's a lot going on here. There's, there's, there's scrolling, there's flashing. And Terry Davis said you know, his vision for Temple OS was a souped-up C64, not a 1970s mainframe. And that looks an awful lot like the genesis that we were just looking at of the Commodore 64, the sparseness of the, the darkness that was upon the void. Only Terry said, let there be light. And I saw this as soon as you boot Temple OS, uh, it's going to go into this installer wizard, and this is what you're going to see. My first reaction, the first thing that I thought of when I saw this, was William Shatner in Airplane 2, <laughs> where Ted Stryker is flying the space shuttle ship, and he's worried about all the buttons and knobs, and William Shatner's talking him, uh, talking him down to the moon base that he lives on, and he says, we've all got our switches, lights, and knobs to deal with, Stryker. I mean, down here, there are literally hundreds and thousands of blinking, beeping, and flashing lights. Blinking and beeping and flashing. They're flashing and they're beeping. I can't stand it anymore, the blinking and beeping and flashing. And then they call me, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. We can get through this, folks. We can fix the blinking. Now, that document format that's custom for Temple OS, I mentioned, uses dollars as its delimiter and BK comma one is the blink tag of the doll doc format. Well, if you go through these three files uh, and you change the BK one to BK zero in a couple of places, there's only about three or four of them, you can rebuild the kernel and restart and the blinking goes away. It's calm. Er, it's calmer, it's better to have to interact with. And if I can, I'm going to try to, uh, demonstrate what that might look like. So cross your fingers that I can start this and show you what it looks like. So we can, for example, look at a cool spinning cube. Ooh. Yeah, trippy. And um, Did I mention it runs Doom? <laughs> Someone ported Doom to Temple OS. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Temple OS has a fixed resolution, right? Temple OS does have a fixed resolution. I believe it's, uh, I believe God said 640 by 480. <laughs> by 16 colors. And 16 colors, that's right. 
Um, and it only supports uh, PS2 keyboard and mouse. Limited, limited driver support, by the way. That is a concern, which is why you're probably only ever going to see Temple OS running in virtual machines. But you can fix the blinking. And, uh, it, and I did. Um, there is a bunch of documentation, including a file called tips, that gives you little things that help make Temple OS usable. Uh, one of the tips says, I copy my files to a mirrored ident partition periodically with copy tree, and I merge commands with merge c colon slash. Note that this is that's a Linux style forward slash. That is not the, the DOS style backslash. Merge c colon slash star d colon slash star plus r plus d to check my changes. Uh, what does plus r and what does plus d do? Well, there's another tip in there that's going to pop up randomly. It's a little like the fortune program. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you just run the, 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 the command tip of day, you just, otherwise you're just going to read the tips file like I did. Merge can be used to see what's changed. Oh, okay. Uh, the plus d flag will show you differences of files. Useful. Uh, and plus r flag will recurse. So merge c star d star plus r plus d does exactly what it says on the tin. And tip of day is full of these things. I, I still keep finding new ones that I, I haven't seen before or that I saw and I forget. So here we are and we've got Temple OS. We know that we can code for it. We know that we can game on it. We know that we can learn stuff about kernel design and timestamps and date time libraries. And we can, we can study this, we can explore it, but it's exceptionally small. It's under 82,000 lines of code the whole thing fits in about 20 megabytes, sometimes less. Uh, one of the biggest files on Temple OS is the uh, autocomplete dictionary, which if you uninstall, knocks the size down tremendously. Temple OS tools are written in Holy C. They're not really cross-platform compatible. And of course, there's no network stack, as I mentioned, which makes sharing code really, really difficult. Now, his official suggestion is to maintain an identical partition and then you copy things to that. If anything goes wrong with your C drive, you copy things back to the D drive and you're good to go. But everyone here should already know backing up and source control are not the same thing. So our solution here, let's add a new operating system because we, we know how to dual boot, right? So we've got some options. Now Terry's suggestion here is have a Temple OS C drive and have a Temple OS backup and move things that way. But we can just have an additional partition there. We can put whatever we want on it. We can, we can keep our C drive. If we can have a D drive if we want it. That's optional. We put something else there. So I tried that. And I took a look at what some of the Linuxes that are around are. Um, I really like the Dev1 project. So I tried uh, Daedalus. I think that's the latest one. And the smallest install that I could get for Dev1 was 340 megabytes. OK. That's significantly larger than 20 megabytes. So now most of my Temple OS VM is going to be used running Linux. Uh, I tried something else with a really cool uh, rolling release distro called Void Linux. Has anyone used Void before? I, a couple? OK, nice, nice. Um, void does not get as much uh, respect as I think that it deserves. Um, and I tried a recent OpenBSD. It's, it's over a gigabyte now. Uh, OpenBSD used to be pretty tiny, but it's grown in size since then. And I remembered way back when there was a project called Damn Small Linux. Damn Small Linux kind of you know, fell into disuse. It came back recently and I was really excited until I read this line. The new goal of Damn Small Linux is a hard limit of 700 megabytes. Damn Small Linux used to be like 50 megabytes. I don't understand that. Um, Linux used to fit on a floppy disk. An actual three and a half inch floppy diskette. This is original. I didn't make this as a prop. You never know. You never know. Um, uh, say that again. Only one floppy. Uh, only one. Okay. Yeah. Free uh, software. This yeah. This is Tom's root boot. So it's Tom's Linux, okay. which has a root system and is bootable. Cool. Doesn't really roll off the tongue, but yep. you never know. The last time I tested this was a couple years ago, and it still worked. So I want Linux, but it's got to be small, and it's got to be able to support FAT32. And eventually, I found something called Tiny Core Linux. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. <laughs> Tiny Core is 64-bit. There's a 32-bit version, but it can run 64-bit. And that's in keeping with the spirit of Temple OS. It's very small. 
it's under 20 megs. The minimum install is just two files. There is a kernel, and then there is a RAM disk that the kernel loads. You can add software to it with a packaging manager called TCE Load, and it can support a GUI, but that is optional. And so, because it can support FAT32, and because we now know that we can have boot manager, uh, bootloaders manage which partition that we're going into, we can actually try only having one FAT32 partition that Temple OS can understand and the boot manager can get to, and that Linux can understand and the boot manager can get to. Two operating systems in the same file system, and you pick which one you want at boot time. So if you're going to install Temple OS this way, the right way, you start with an empty disk, you boot Linux, you partition it how you want, you format it with FAT32, you leave Linux, you go into Temple OS, you install Temple OS. This will happen automatically, but it all lives in a file that you can invoke if you get to the, 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 the interpreter prompt. It's under uh, slash misc, it's called OS install. You don't format the C drive, it'll ask you to yes or no, you say no. It'll ask you do you want to install the Temple OS bootloader, you say no. You reboot back into Linux. You mount the hard drive, let's say it's under uh, MNT slash SDA1. You make a directory called TCE slash boot. You put your corp pure64.gz and your VM Linux 64 in, in that file. And then you install the sys Linux bootloader. This is the magic sauce that makes it work. Sys Linux is really just like three or four files. Most distros already have this installed and they just use grub instead. Uh, under user lib syslinux modules BIOS, there's two .c32 files. You want menu and libutil, copy that to your, your, your partition, just right into the root directory. Uh, you edit your syslinux.config file, and then you dd the MBR of syslinux over those, those precious 512 bytes that you have on your machine. You'll notice that the byte size of this dd command is 440, not 512. Well, what happened to that other 72 bytes? That's your partition table. You don't want to mess with that. And then you run syslinux-i on your, your partition, and it works. This is syslinux.cfg. If you're going to take one photograph of any slide, it should probably be this one, because there's a lot of trial and error that went into this. All it's saying is, give me a boot menu, give me two options. One called temple OS, one called tiny core. If I pick temple OS, just boot the kernel, boot slash kernel.bin.c. If I'm booting Linux, I'm going to give you the path to the kernel, the path to the, uh, the RAM disk, and uh, some, append some kernel arguments. This also works on Windows. I have tested this with FAT32 capable Windows versions. I've got a Windows 98 CD in here and a Windows XP CD in here. All you really need to do is make a backup of your MBR to a text file or to a, fi a file on the disk. And then you say boot that in your Windows, uh, your Windows sys Linux config file. If you have an old version of Windows which can exit Windows back into DOS or just straight up MS DOS, uh, you can go directly to Linux without passing Go, without collecting two hundred dollars, and without rebooting. If you run a command called loadlin, the loadlin project is really interesting. Um, but if you're going to do that, use TinyCore thirteen. Uh, I think they're up to fifteen now, and I've had problems with more recent versions of TinyCore. So why are we doing this? I bother with this at all. Uh, you don't have to pre-pick your partition sizes. I really hate having to guess what I'm going to need on a machine when I have just setting it up on day one. So you get exactly the right size partition this way. You're just assuming all of the data belongs in one partition and you can grow it either using Temple OS or Linux how you want. You don't need an intermediary thing to copy uh, data back and forth that Temple OS and Linux can understand. They are coexisting. And you can use Temple OS tools. You can use Linux tools. Um, but what about data integrity? File systems have bugs, especially really bespoke custom ones. It would be nice to know if you've got file corruption before you actually start using the file. So uh, everyone here knows what a checksum is, right? I see heads nodding. Um, then I'm going to largely skip this example. All you really need to know is that a checksum is a mathematical uh, algorithm. It's a computation. When different data goes in, you get a different result. When the same data goes in, you know because you're getting the same output. Even if I'm using the letters DOG, I get a big number. This is a terrible checksum, but it's the first thing that came to mind. If I change those letters around, it's all still the same bytes. They're in a different order. I get a totally different answer. Now, 
Linux has checksum utilities. It has MD5, it has SHA-1, then there are several others, but these are, these are the two big dogs, and they're still in use even though you should not use MD5 or SHA-1 for really secure communications purposes. But it's good for checking to make sure if your files have changed over time or if your data is corrupt. There was no Temple OS equivalent for MD5, but there is now. Uh, split screen here is uh, at the bottom. <coughs> Uh, you just run md5sum on a kernel file and you get your, your checksum result, 9, C, B, 6, whatever. Uh, and then under temple OS, I've written md5sum on that same kmain file. You get 9, C, B, 6, 0, yada, yada, yada. The checksum algorithms are the same. You can run md5 now in temple OS. Feel free to ooh. ooh. Thank you. Ah. Ooh, no, no ah, no ah. <laughs> Here's the code. It exists. It's written in purely in Holy C. Mm -hmm. Don't take a screenshot of that. It's online. If you want to use MD5 as an example, here's just some code that I threw together. You run this once a day. It makes a directory in your home directory, looks at every file under your home directory, non-recursive, and then just writes the checksums of those files to that directory. You can track changes over time. Not the specific changes, but you can see if a file has changed. And this is just a little way uh, to, to show that this is an example that works where you were calling MD5, uh, the MD5 sum function, but you're, you're checksumming your home directory. But MD5 is deprecated. It's ancient. Pretty much everyone has moved to SHA-1 by now. Um, BitTorrent uses SHA-1. Git specifically uses SHA-1 to come up with its hashes. There's no Temple OS equivalent for SHA-1. But there is now. <laughs> Now feel free to ah. ah. Same checksum in Temple OS as in, uh, as in Linux. This is the same VM, but it's also different instances of, of running one OS versus the other. So we've got MD5 now. You've got SHA-1 uh, now. But checksums are only part of it. Git computes checksums, but Git does not actually care about any of the metadata about your content. You ever check out something from Git, it's going to have a current timestamp. It is not going to tell you when that file was checked in. Even if the file is really old and you checked it in a long time ago, it's going to check it out and say, this is a new file, and it's going to have a, today's timestamp. That always bothered me. Um, Git checks content, but there's more stuff to content. There's modification times and ownership. And there's a utility called mtree. This came over from uh, the BSDs. It exists in Linux. Um, you can install it on Debian with mtree-net BSD. I prefer one written in Go, actually, which is multi-platform, which is nice. It creates a spec file that tells you directories, files in those directories, modification time, ownership, size, that kind of thing. It's like ls-r, but you can't take ls-r and say, hey, I have a file tree. ls-r, can you make this file tree look like what's in LS, the, the ls-r output. With mtree you can. You can basically take a snapshot of the metadata of your file tree, store that somewhere. If something changes, you can come back and see which files have been modified, even if the size is the same, even if the checksum is the same. If ownership or permissions have changed, mtree will figure that out for you. But there is no temple OS equivalent to mtree. Maybe you see where this is going. So I wrote mtree for temple OS as well. Uh, this is written uh, to be compatible with the Go-based mtree that I showed you um, in a previous slide. This is just spitting out directories, files, what type they are, if they're a directory, or what size they are, if they're a file, and their modification time in a, uh, a Unix-compatible timestamp, not a C-date temple OS timestamp, so that you can actually do stuff uh, in Linux with this, this spec file. So, to summarize, we now have MD5 for Temple OS. Uh, we now have SHA-1 uh, sum for Temple OS, and we have mtree. Uh, these will be available on my website at that URL today for the very first time. Where do we go from here? Remember, if in the open source software world, if there's something you're looking for and it's not available, build it. There are still a bunch of Unix utilities that are lacking. I, don't see any good way to be able to in integrate things like head, tail, grep. Temple OS doesn't really use pipes that way. Um, but now that we have checked something, we can do like incremental file copying. That would be really cool if someone wants to implement rsync for Temple OS or something like xcopy or, or robocopy would be great. Um, 
Git, I would love to see a Git client. That's really why I'm here and talking about this is someone can basically say, hey, SHA-1 already exists. Let's take a look at Zlib compression for Temple OS because with those two things, you can get started building a Git client. Uh, there are a couple links here for how to be able to uh, port part, uh, third party programs to Temple OS and how to do TinyCore NTFS integration so that you can run TinyCore on more recent versions of Windows or really old versions of DOS like um, version 4 that was just uh, open source this week. You're probably asking, why does any of this matter? What's the point? This is from Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. When, uh, when Mike TV asks about his factory, why is everything here completely pointless? And Charlie Bucket says, candy doesn't have to have a point. That's why it's candy. And Temple OS is exactly the same way. Why is it so bizarre, weird, different? It doesn't have to have a point. It simply is. And with that, class has ended. Go in peace. <laughs>
it's very easy to do. You can essentially say, make a snapshot of my Temple OS and, and give me an ISO of my distro, my Temple OS. If you knew how to export that, possibly by using one of the techniques that I outlined today, you can take that ISO, move it to a different machine, start a VM with that, and reinstall that version of Temple OS onto a new thing. It is capable of moving, evolving, and shifting. One more question, and then I think I'm going to wrap it here. Anything, anything, anything? Bueller? Bueller? Thank you for your time.